All right. Welcome, folks. Starting up the recording. Scott couldn't make it this week, so I'm kind of filling in. And actually, we have a suta lined up back by popular demand. It is the Anapanasati Suta. So, <laughs> we also got some new friends here, Keba and Patrick's back. So, it's wonderful to see folk coming in and interested in the Dhamma. So, here we go from the Majna Makea 118 Mindfulness of Breathing. So, this is the Bhikkhu Bodhi translation. So here's the introduction section. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in Savati in Eastern Park in the palace of Margajuna's mother, together with many very well-known elder disciples, the Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Moha Mogalana and Venerable Maha Kasapa and the Venerable Maha Kachana, the Venerable Maha Kathintika, Venerable Maha Kapina and Venerable Maha Kanda and the Venerable Aranunda and the Venerable Ravanata and the Venerable Ananda and many <coughs> and other very well known elder disciples. Also, yep, the recording has started too. We're all good on that. But yeah, so pretty much it's just gathering up that hey. All the elder disciples are here. They're gathering in Savati. And because the Buddha is going to lay down the Anapanasati here. So, now I've heard on that occasion, elder bhikkhus had been teaching and instructing bhikkhus, new bhikkhus, some elder bhikkhus, had been teaching and instructing 10 bhikkhus, some elder bhikkhus had been teaching and instructing 20, 30, 40 bhikkhus. And new bhikkhus taught and instructed by the elder bhikkhus had achieved successive stages of high distinction. On that occasion, the Upanitha day of the 15th on the full moon of Pravana ceremony, the blessed one was seated in an open surround <clears throat> in the open surrounded by the Sangha of bhikkhus. Then surveying the silent Sangha of bhikkhus, he addressed them thus. Bhikkhus, I am confident with this progress. My mind is content with this progress. So arouse still more energy in you to attain the unattained, to achieve the unachieved, to realize the unrealized. I shall wait here at Savati for the Kumna full moon of the fourth month. The bhikkhus of the countryside heard. The Blessed One will wait there at Savati for the Kumna full moon of the fourth month. And the bhikkhus of the countryside left in due course for Savati to see the Blessed One. And elder bhikkhus still more intensively taught and instructed new bhikkhus. Some elder bhikkhus taught and instructed 10 bhikkhus. Some elder bhikkhus taught and instructed 20, 30, 40 bhikkhus. And new bhikkhus taught and instructed the elder bhikkhus and achieved high stages of high distinction. Or achieved successive stages of high distinction. On that occasion, on the Upasana day of the 15th, the full moon and night of the Kumundi full moon of the fourth month, the Blessed One was seated and open surrounding by the Sangha of Bhikkhus. Then, surveilling the silent Sangha of bhikkhus, he addressed them thus. Bhikkhus, this assembly is free from prattle. This assembly is free from chatter. It consists purely of heartwood. Such is the Sangha of bhikkhus. Such is this assembly. Such is an assembly as is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of reverenation, salutation, an incomparable field of merit for this world, such is the Sangha of bhikkhus, such is this assembly, such is an assembly that a small gift given to it becomes even great, and a greater gift greater, such is the Sangha of bhikkhus, such is this assembly, such is this assembly as is rare for the world to see, such is the Sangha of bhikkhus, such is this assembly. Such is this assembly as would be worth journeying many leagues with a travel bag to see. 
such is the Sangha of Bhikkhus, such is this assembly. So I'm just going to pause for a moment if anybody has any questions or wants to add anything. Kind of getting through the introductory. No? Okay, cool. I'll continue through. In the Sangha of Bhikkhus, there are Bhikkhus who are Arahants, with the taints destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what has had to be done, laid down the burden, reached their goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and are completely liberated through final knowledge. Such bhikkhus are there in the Sangha of bhikkhus. In this Sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who, with the destruction of the five lower fetters, due to are due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and attain their final nibbana without ever returning to the world. Such bhikkhus are there in this sangha of bhikkhus. In this sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who, with the destruction of the lower fetters and with the attention, oh, attenation of lust, hate, and delusion, are once returners, returning once to this world to make an end of suffering. Such bhikkhus are in the Sangha of bhikkhus. In the Sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who, with the destruction of the lower fetters, are stream enterers, no longer subject to predination, bound for deliverance, headed for enlightenment. Such bhikkhus are there in the Sangha of bhikkhus. In the Sangha of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis who have devoted to the development of the four foundations of mindfulness, such bhikkhus are there in the Sangha of bhikkhus. In the Sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who abide, devoted to the development of the four right kinds of striving, the four bases of spiritual power, the five faculties, the five powers, the seven factors of enlightenment, the Noble Eightfold Path. Such bhikkhus are here or are there in the Sangha of bhikkhus. In the Sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who abide devoted to development of loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy, of equanimity, of the meditation on foulness, on the perception of impermanence. Such bhikkhus are there in the Sangha of bhikkhus. In this Sangha of bhikkhus, there are bhikkhus who abide, devoted to the development of mindfulness, of breathing. So this is where he gets into mindfulness of breathing. So this is that's sort of the introductory part. So it's just setting the stage too about this is a big gathering. For example, I think, you know, we have Ananda there and I believe also Sariputta. So we've got a lot of folks gathering together for him to kind of lay out what is mindfulness of in and out breathing, right? Mindfulness with in or out breathing, all right? So this is going to get into the stage now. And he's also talking too about, you know, how there's all these different kind of meditations that are being practiced. We have like love and kindness. We have foulness of the body, you know, all of it kind of coming together, the five powers, right? So a bunch of different practices, but he's putting on sort of center stage here, mindfulness with breathing. So yeah, is there any questions before I continue? All right, cool. So I'm gonna st start out here. Mindfulness with breathing. Bhikkhus, when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is of great fruit and benefit. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it fulfills the four foundations of mindfulness. When mindfulness of breathing, or sorry, when the four foundations of mindfulness are developed and cultivated, they fulfill the seven factors of enlightenment. When the seven factors of enlightenment are developed and cultivated, they fulfill true knowledge and deliverance. And how, bhikkhus, is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated so that it is of great fruit and benefit? Here, a bhikkhu, gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut, sits down, having folded his legs crosswise 
set his body erect, and established mindfulness in front of him. Ever mindful, he breathes in. Ever mindful, he breathes out. Breathing in long, he understands. I breathe in long. Or breathing out long, he understands. I breathe out long. Breathing in short, he understands. I breathe in short. Or breathing out short, he understands. I breathe out short. He trains thus. I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body of breath. He trains thus. I breathe out experiencing the whole body of breath. He trains thus. I shall breathe in tranquilizing the bodily formation. He trains thus. I shall breathe out tranquilizing the bodily formation. And so here I'm just going to pause for a moment to just add like this is talking very much to all these aspects are working with the body, right? So this is kind of, we're going to get to like how this covers the four foundations of mindfulness, right? But this is covering the body aspect, which is one of the foundations of mindfulness. Furthermore, you notice too how he says on each one of these things, he trains thus. So the Buddha is like he trains. This is a mental development, a training, right? So we're training that sati, that skill of wakefulness. With the in-breath, you know, we know we are breathing in. And we also know if it's long or short, right? And breathing out long, we know if it's long or short. So we got to be here now. <laughs> we got to be aware, awake, in order to discern that. So it's a good starting point and very grounding. It's a good ending point, too. <laughs> so I'm going to move now on to the second part here he trains thus i shall breathe in experiencing rapture he trains thus i shall breathe out experiencing rapture he trains thus i shall breathe in experiencing pleasure he trains thus i shall breathe out experiencing pleasure he trains thus i shall breathe in experiencing the mental formation he trains thus i shall breathe out experiencing mental formation he trains thus, I shall breathe in, tranquilizing the mental formation. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, tranquilizing the mental formation. And so this is working kind of with another aspect of, you know, the four foundations of mindfulness, which is really kind of paying attention to the feelings. But this is also paying attention in a way to like the emotions as well, right? But this kind of cultivating here, actually a pleasant abiding. We're training to experience and, and in the first one here, right? So e each of these 16 steps, they can be broken down actually into sets of four, which kind of helps to understand. And then we can kind of to really help remember it, go like, okay, this goes with the feeling aspect, right? But we're training, experiencing rapture. So what is, you know, rapture here? So Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, you know, um, translates this as rapture. But um, another way we can look at it is sort of like a successful joy, right? So this is this feeling. It's a bit active, right? So this is a, you know, pleasant feeling. It's actually, too, if one is familiar with the jhanas, it's one of the jhana factors. And then also talking about, Oh, did I mention? Yeah, that's PT as well, right? So the um, poly trans, like the poly version of that is PT, right? So rapture is being translated from PT. And then also with the um, pleasure, right? So experiencing pleasure, right? So in the poly, that is sukha. So that is satisfaction, that is ease. So the way that is translated here is pleasure. And again, I'm not trying to take away from uh, the translation too. I'm just sort of like adding to it and also in terms of like what I've, you know, been practicing with Dom Morado and all that stuff as well, kind of going off of that. So just kind of running through, you know, these aspects here. And oh, and also if there's any questions or what have you before I move on, just like let me know. All right, cool. So actually, I'm just going to go over too because there's talking about mental, you know, formation here, and sometimes it can be a little bit confusing about like what is a mental formation. Well, that's like a sankara, which is the Pali word for it. But one of the ways to think about it is like habitual sort of um, 
emotional patterns, especially in the context here, right? So, like, it's interesting the way Don Morado puts it, is it's like a big pile of garbage, right? Like, all of our past conditionings and all that stuff. Essentially, our, our memory, and here, like, our emotional memory, right? So, we kind of feel, like, icky because of like things in the past or we feel joy dependent on things that have happened in the past so this is kind of breathing in and out becoming aware of that as it comes up i mean we can even kind of work that in in a funny way with like becoming aware of the hindrances as those are send carters that come up and we can see those and then we can let go of it and we actually continue to the um next part here where it talks about tranquilizing stealing those mental formations Right, so stilling, letting go, releasing those mental formations, letting go of that past baggage, right? <laughs> All the garbage. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to move on to the third section here. He trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the mind. He trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing the mind. He trains thus, I shall breathe in gladdening the mind. He trains thus, I breathe out gladdening the mind. He trains thus, I shall breathe in, concentrating the mind. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, concentrating the mind. He trains thus, I shall breathe in, liberating the mind. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, liberating the mind. So this is again the third tetrad, and it's talking about the mind. So this is another factor of the foundations of mindfulness right here, right? And it really brings together. So what's interesting is if we think about practicing these in like sequential order, sometimes it's not necessarily the most, um, I could say like helpful thing or, or what have you, <laughs> the most beneficial thing, I'll say that. What can be helpful is actually step nine and 10. So becoming aware of the mind and gladdening the mind, right? So Don Murado talks about this quite a bit in practicing on Apanasati, as this is actually one of the first things that we want to work with, is becoming aware of the mind, becoming aware of the co uh, the contents of it. You know, are there a bunch of like unwholesome thoughts arising in the mind and actually applying the right effort? So now I'm talking about the Noble Eightfold Path and one of the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right effort. And applying that right effort to drop the unwholesome drop the unwholesome thoughts that have arisen in the mind we see oh this is an unwholesome thought that has arisen i and this is where it really works with the congratulations like actually rather than having that oh my gosh i'm so bad at meditation i just got distracted you know <laughs> this is awful i suck at meditation rather than having those thoughts and having those persist we can drop those we can return to congratulations like, congratulations, we caught it. We we did actually have sati, which is what this is all about as well, another aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is that waking up. And again, this is noble right sati. It's not any, you know, ordinary mindfulness. This is within the context of the Noble Eightfold Path and for the realization of the end of dissatisfaction. So, again, it's bringing that together. Number nine here, too, it's talking about um, becoming aware, right? So that's actually having that awareness, having that mindfulness of mind so that we can actually change from the unwholesome thoughts to the wholesome thoughts. And that, of course, requires the development and cultivation of, you know, right viewing, right looking. And so I'm going to cover a couple of the other ones that we went over as well, which is talking about concentration. So another way we can think of concentration is within that context of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is it actually all the path factors come together to support, right, noble concentration, right? It's a, it's a, um, it's a unifying, it's unifying the mind, it's collecting the mind together. So it doesn't need to be like this single pointed, one pointed concentration, but rather it's we, if we think about it as concentration, we can think about it as concentrating out the unwholesome, concentrating out, um, <laughs> you know, the 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 less skillful qualities in that way, right? But it's more about unifying the mind and bringing it together. And so, you know, if talking about Domerado here, one of the um, things that he uh, brings up 
when talking about concentration. If you do talk to Don Murado, you bring up concentration, you're likely going to hear about, you know, concentrated orange juice, right? And I think I should cover, too, the fact that, you know, the poly word that for concentration here is samadhi, right? So nobody drinks 100%, you know, concentrated orange juice. If anyone's familiar with that, it, like, comes frozen, right? No, yeah, so you got to add the water to it. Once you add the water to it, then it becomes samadhi, right? So this is a this is a helpful thing, right? And so this is that aspect of, you know, gathering the mind together. You know, as we breathe in and we breathe out. And then it's also talking about breathing out and liberating the mind. So freeing the mind, liberating the mind. This is working with that, that 12th step. And again, when we have no troubles, no worries, no cares, the mind is liberated. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions or want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I just want to ask, um, when it says the mind, does it mean like the totality of your experience or is it something different? Yeah, so I think here, I mean, on one way, I mean, we could look at it that way, but I think that it's talking about, again, that that faculty of the mind, right? So this is sort of like the thinking mind. We can perhaps like internal images, internal uh you know, speech that we might have, you know, perception, like all these, like generally actually here to specifically within this context, it's talking more as well about the mental state. So if we're talking about the foundations of mindfulness, it's also talking about the mental states, right? So that's sort of that aspect of mind. So it's not so much about like, okay, like in some spiritual traditions, you know, they'll talk about like the totality of experience, all is mind and what have you, right? That is something where actually when we get more towards the next stage, which is about um, the fourth foundation of, of mindfulness, which is the dhammas, right? And that's more like everything, right? So it's like one of the ways we can translate that is like objects of mind. So that's like pretty much like everything <laughs> in, one, in one sense, right? So, but this is more referring to like the state of mind, right? in this context here. So, is there any, did that answer your question or? <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So, and yeah, if there's no more questions, I'll move on to the fourth part here. Oh yeah. What's the difference between the rapture and bliss and gladdening the mind uh, practically? Uh... Gladdening the mind, okay. And what's the difference between that rapture. with like, yeah, the rapture and bliss? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of interesting because they work together, right? Mm -hmm. So, and this is what's really helpful is thinking about it like a pincer movement. So we have the body, right? And we're breathing in long and we're oxygenating the body well and we're relaxing the body, tranquilizing the body formations. We're covering the body. So physically we're in a good state. And then we also have the mental qualities where now, OK, we're thinking one wholesome thought after another and we're changing, you know, the mental states. Right. This is going to actually work in the feelings, which are kind of like the middle point between the body and the mind. Right. And so we actually start to experience like this <laughs> experience of bliss, of, of rapture, of pity and sukha, of joy and success. So it's kind of that middle ground in between. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, but really practically, like, do you try to get into rapture or it comes by itself? Or because they're, they're, you talk about gladdening the mind practically, yeah. but the rapture and the bliss? Yeah, so you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think, again, it's putting in the right noble effort. So, again, if we're thinking, if the body is in a good state, and well, sometimes even if it's not in a good state, we can be feeling quite well at sometimes even when we're sick. But with the, you know, changing from the unwholesome to the wholesome, working with that aspect of mind, we talk ourselves, you know, into feeling good and we eventually do feel good. Right. So it actually comes up. So in one way, I'm not I think one if the mind is quite unified, like it, there's quite a bit of playroom. 
in terms of like being able to sort of will these things in, right? It's not through craving. It's about having the confidence of like, oh yeah, I can feel joy right now, <laughs> you know? But also we don't have this super high expectation either. That's what help is so helpful. Hey, this is good enough, right? And this is kind of really when we work into being much more in that liberation, right? And this is where getting in touch with impermanence, letting go, and dropping things. Because it, it actually, all these things, they, they roll around in kind of a circle and a spiral. And they kind of um, help to reinforce each other, right? So all these different foundations of mindfulness, as well as these 16 steps, they all work together. So I, I have found through practice, you know, as I um, let go more and more, <laughs> it's easier for joy and rapture to kind of be willed in, if you will. Right. But that's because I'm not really expecting anything from reality. <laughs> yeah. But gliding in the mind's part of that. Yeah. So, again, it's it's one of those things where it's like, hey, you know, directly look, see, you know, I think sometimes folks want, well, are trying to kind of follow a rule set that might not even be there. So just keep looking and discerning. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And. Uh, did that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. The question is, are you satisfied? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll continue on, though, and cover that, that spot there. And then I might work through it a little bit more with a little less commentary, um, just because I would like to finish it, if possible. So here we go. He trains thus. I shall breathe in contemplating impermanence. He trains thus. I shall breathe out contemplating impermanence. He trains thus. I shall breathe in contemplating fading away. He trains thus. I shall breathe in contemplating fading away. He trains thus. I shall breathe in contemplating cessation. He trains thus. I shall breathe out contemplating cessation. He trains thus, I shall breathe in, contemplating relinquishment. He trains thus, I shall breathe out, contemplating relinquishment. Because that is how mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, so that it is of great fruit and benefit. So that was what I was just talking about there in terms of the impermanence coming in of becoming aware of the change, right? The change in the sensations in the body, the change of how like everything is fading away. And also a really helpful thing with this is that everything is subject to change, including ourselves. We can change, we can make a wholesome change. So that's another sort of aspect of it. You know, I, I it, in a summary of kind of like bringing things together here in terms of like, you know, this sort of lineage that's been passed down and like through Domerado as well, you know, and all of his teachers kind of like summing it up quite simply as remember, look, change. And then you just repeat that, right? So this is actually that sati, that looking, right? So actually right noble looking, that discernment. Is this wholesome? Is this unwholesome? Does this lead to dukkha or does this not lead to dukkha? And then the right effort to change that so we can make a wholesome change put in that right effort but here it's talking too as well about the fading away so all phenomena fade away another way of looking at this as well is that also that craving that tonha that thirsting right so this is the second noble truth what is the cause of dukkha that unwise thirsting by becoming more and more aware how everything fades away decays and dies as well dukkha dies it fades away it ends with that there is that cessation of dukkha uh, i mean and also the cessation of everything everything ends um but also with that we let go we relinquish you know <laughs> we release it all right um i think bhikkhu buddha dasa he has a quote you know about how we were thieves all along and giving it all back to nature right so that's one, one way of looking at it there. So, yeah. So any questions before I kind of continue on? No? All right. 
So now we're going to go over the fulfillment of the four foundations of mindfulness, which I've kind of been going over in the commentary there. So, and bhikkhus, or and how bhikkhus, is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated fulfill the four foundations of mindfulness? Bhikkhus, on whatever occasion a bhikkhu, breathing in long understands I breathe in long, or breathing out long understands I breathe out long, breathing in short understands I breathe in short, or breathing out short understands I breathe out short, drains thus. I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body of breath. I shall breathe out experiencing the whole body of breath. I shall breathe in tranquilizing the bodily formation. I shall breathe out tranquilizing the bodily formation. On that occasion, a bhikkhu abides contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware and mindful. Having put away covetousness and grief for the world, I say to this is a certain body among bodies, namely in breathing and out breathing. That is why on that occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. Bhikkhus, on whatever occasion a bhikkhu trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing rapture. Trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing rapture. Trains thus. I shall breathe in experiencing pleasure. Trains thus. I shall breathe out experiencing pleasure. Trains thus. I shall breathe in experiencing mental formation. Trains thus. I shall breathe out experiencing mental formation. Trains thus. I shall breathe in tranquilizing the mental formation. Trains thus. I shall breathe out tranquilizing the mental formation. On that occasion, a bhikkhu abides contemplating the feelings as feelings, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. I say that this is a certain feeling among feelings, namely, given close attention to the in-breathing and the out-breathing, that this is why on that occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating feelings as feelings, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. And bhikkhus, on whatever occasion a bhikkhu trains thus, I shall breathe experiencing the bot or experiencing the mind, trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing the mind, trains thus, I shall breathe in gladdening the mind, trains thus, I shall breathe out gladdening the mind, trains thus. I shall breathe in concentrating the mind, trains thus. I shall breathe out concentrating the mind, trains thus. I shall breathe in liberating the mind, trains thus. I shall breathe out liberating the mind. On that occasion, a bhikkhu, having put, oh wait. <laughs> On that occasion, a bhikkhu abides contemplating the mind as mind, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. I do not say that there is a development of mindfulness of breathing for one who is forgetful, one who is not fully aware. That is why on that occasion a bhikkhu abides, contemplating the mind as mind, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put covetousness and grief for the world away. Or having put away covetousness and grief for the world. Bhikkhus, on whatever occasion a bhikkhu trains thus, I shall train breathing in contemplating impermanence. Trains thus, I shall breathe out contemplating impermanence. Trains thus, I shall breathe in contemplating fading away. Trains thus, I shall breathe out contemplating fading away. Trains thus, I shall breathe in contemplating cessation. Trains thus. I shall breathe out contemplating cessation, trains thus. I shall breathe in contemplating relinquishment, trains thus. I shall breathe out contemplating relinquishment. On that occasion, a bhikkhu abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. 
Having seen with wisdom and the abandonment of covetousness and grief, he closely looks on with equanimity. That is why on that occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. Bhikkhus, that is how mindfulness of breathing, developed and cultivated, fulfills the four foundations of mindfulness. So that's that section talking about how mindfulness with in or out breathing fulfills the four foundations of mindfulness. The four foundations of mindfulness is a really, really wonderful list and a very succinct pointer about like what the object is. Like, yes, it is the breath, but furthermore, it's actually the four foundations of mindfulness. There's another sutta which talks about the heap of the wholesome, <laughs> which is a short sutta. Um, and it points to the four foundations of mindfulness. So if you're kind of like, okay, what is wholesome? What is unwholesome? The four foundations of mindfulness are a pretty safe bet there. So now we're going to get to the fulfillment of the seven factors or the seven enlightenment factors. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add or <laughs> before I continue? No? Okay. We're content, satisfied, <laughs> at ease. <laughs> okay. So here we go. Fulfillment of the seven factors of enlightenment. And how bhikkhus do the four foundations of mindfulness developed and cultivated fulfill the seven factors of or seven enlightenment factors? Bhikkhus, on whatever occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world, on that occasion unremitting mindfulness is established in him. On whatever occasion unremitting mindfulness is established in a bhikkhu, on that occasion mindfulness, the mindfulness enlightenment factor is aroused in him. He develops it, and by development it comes to fulfillment in him. Abiding thus mindful, he investigates and examines that state with wisdom and embarks upon a full inquiry into it. On whatever occasion, abiding thus mindful, a bhikkhu investigates and examines that state with wisdom and embarks upon it full, uh, or sorry, embarks upon a full inquiry into it. On that occasion, the investigation of states Enlightenment factor is aroused in him. He develops it, and by development, it comes to fulfillment in him. And one who investigates and examines that state with wisdom and embarks upon a full inquiry into it. Tireless energy is aroused. On whatever occasion, tireless energy is aroused in the bhikkhu who investigates and examines that state with wisdom and embarks upon a full inquiry into it. On that occasion, the energy enlightenment factor is aroused in him. He develops it, and by development, it comes to fulfillment in him. In one who has aroused energy, unworldly rapture arises. On whatever occasion, unworldly rapture arises in a bhikkhu who has energy aroused, or who has aroused energy. On that occasion, the rapture enlightenment factor is aroused in him. He develops it, and by development, it comes to fulfillment in him. In one who is rapturous, the body and mind become tranquil. On whatever occasion, the body and the mind become tranquil in a bhikkhu who is rapturous. On that occasion, the tranquility enlightenment factor is aroused in him. He develops it. And by development, it comes to fulfillment in him. In one whose body is tranquil and who feels pleasure, the mind becomes concentrated. On whatever occasion the mind becomes concentrated in a bhikkhu who is tranquil and who feels pleasure, on that occasion, the concentration enlightenment factor is aroused in him, and he develops it. And by development, it comes to fulfillment in him. He closely looks on with equanimity and thus concentrated. On whatever occasion a bhikkhu closely looks and examines with equanimity at the mind thus concentrated, on that occasion the equanimity enlightenment factor is aroused in him, 
and he develops it, and by development it comes to fulfillment in him. Bhikkhus, on whatever occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating his feelings as feelings, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world, the equanimity enlightenment factor is aroused in him. He develops it, and by development it comes to fulfillment in him. Bhikkhus, on whatever occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating mind as mind, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world, the equanimity enlightenment factor is aroused in him. He develops it, and by development it comes to fulfillment in him. Bhikkhus, on whatever occasion a bhikkhu abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects, ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world, the equanimity factor is aroused in him. He develops it, and by development it comes to fulfillment in him. Bhikkhus, that is how the four foundations of mindfulness developed and cultivated fulfill the seven enlightenment factors. So we're almost finished the sutta. I just have a couple short paragraphs. Is there any questions before I move on to that? No. All right, I'll finish it up then. So, fulfillment of true knowledge and deliverance. And how bhikkhus do the seven enlightenment factors developed and cultivated fulfill true knowledge and deliverance. Here bhikkhus, a bhikkhu develops mindfulness or the mindfulness enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. He develops and investigates the state's enlightenment factor, the energy enlightenment factor, the rapture enlightenment factor, the tranquility enlightenment factor, the concentration enlightenment factor, the equanimity enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. Because that is how the seven factors, or sorry, because that is how the seven enlightenment factors developed and cultivated fulfill true knowledge and deliverance. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So that's it. <laughs> there we go. We got through the Anapanasati Sutta. And I don't mean it like we got through it in terms of, oh, that was a slog. Again, the Anapanasati Sutta is wonderful for coming back and as a reference point and really helpful that beginning part where he talks about how everyone's coming together. The Buddha is talking about the Anapanasati Sutta and a wonderful thing. This is like a good, wholesome thought to remember when we're practicing Anapanasati, that this is of great fruit and benefit, right? So this is, this is beneficial. I think one of the interesting things is um, sometimes like folks will be like, oh, there's no benefit to meditation at all. But like here, it, it clearly states that this is of great fruit and benefit. So it is, you know, very positive. It's very helpful. It's very skillful to practice anapanasati, to practice mindfulness of, you know, in and out breathing. The in and out breathing is very helpful. <laughs> So remember, sometimes it's shortened to just mindfulness of breathing, but that in and out really does help to cultivate sati. And we see here too how it comes together with developing the four foundations of mindfulness, and that leads to the seven factors of awakening, and the seven factors of awakening lead to knowledge and deliverance, aka <laughs> enlightenment, which is very simply put as, okay, we're shining a light on, this is the knowledge. We're having knowledge of dukkha. So this is having direct knowledge of dissatisfaction, suffering, stress, right? Understanding that and then shining a light on that. So that's the knowledge. That's one part of enlightenment. And then the other part of enlightenment is lightening up, right? So lightening up the load of dropping the dukkha, being able to see it, being able to understand that and let go, which, you know, Step 16 of Anapanasati, you know, but we do that through seeing, hey, everything's changing. So Anapanasati is the complete package, you know, and you can see how it is uh, the, um, you could say, method that is, um, 
you know, prescribed by the Buddha. And it's also there, we can see how another thing is it's also developing the Noble Eightfold Path because when the Noble Eightfold Path is developed, that's the seven factors of awakening that lead to knowledge and deliverance. So that was just my little commentary on the end. If anybody has any questions or would like to add anything, you're more than welcome to. Yeah, um, what what books would you recommend to read up on Anapanasati? Yeah, so in terms of books, I'd probably recommend like anything by Bhikkhu Buddha Das is pretty good. But in all honesty, the best book you're going to read about Anapanasati is the one in between your ears. So like, <laughs> that that's something I, I, I would say. So like definitely, you know, going to reading... Like Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa has a couple about Anapanasati, you know. Um, but in all honesty, it's through like directly practicing it that, you know. And again, there's the Anapanasati Sutta. So suttas are really good, I would say, to read because they kind of go right back to the source material as well. So, you know, kind of getting away a bit from the commentaries. Of course, one thing to be aware of the suttas is that, you know, they are. Um, you know, being uh, translated. So if you're reading them in English, right, it's a translation, right? So again, it's one of those things where the best thing you can do is practice on Aponasati, um, really. And I would say, too, another helpful thing to remember is that the practice of getting into seclusion is helpful. So I think that when it comes to, like, um, practicing, you know, meditation, we don't necessarily have to get formal and informal. Or practice, you see, like, even meditation as we get into is probably not the best word for it because it's more like we're developing and cultivating the mind, right? But so we get into seclusion to do that, right? So that's a helpful way of looking at it. And also throughout the day, it's like when we remember, we can wake up and take like those long, deep in breaths. Like even right now, you know, during the recording, as I'm speaking, actually, as I was reading the Anapanasati Sutta, I don't know if you noticed, but I was taking those breaths and breathing along to those sections where it's like, you know, he trains thus, I breathe in long, knowing that I breathe in long, breathing out long, I know I am breathing out long. So it is like that, right? So that's one of the things that I can say would be quite helpful. But yeah, like anything by Bhikkhu Buddha Das is going to be helpful. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. But yeah, I'm I'm quite glad, you know. <laughs> so you you don't do go through the steps by step. You you use whatever works at the where you are. Yeah, so there isn't I would say a hard and a fast rule and actually I practice in both ways personally so i will sometimes practice actually going through the steps and kind of like going through it very much as it is in the sutta almost as like a mantra and working through them you know maybe not like one to the other but like going in like the breathing portion that's something that is more like just helping to gladden the mind in like step 10 as you remember it and also just to recall what the steps are free form that being said, that's not necessarily, that's like something that I recommend if somebody feels like doing that in order to like gladden the mind. Um, again, you can kind of go to whatever step you feel is kind of currently happening, right? That can be a helpful thing. Like you don't necessarily have to direct towards a specific step or what seems most beneficial at that time. Also understand too that the steps don't necessarily have to be so much um like their own separate thing. Sometimes they can go into each other, right? So even one can be, you know, aware of the long breath, but also being aware of impermanence too. You know, the mind works really quick. So that's sort of that element. And this is sort of also working with that, getting away from that idea of one pointed zero in concentration, but rather bringing the mind in samadhi and unification. Because the idea here is this all comes back to serving the purpose of putting an end to dukkha. That's why we want to be aware of the four foundations of mindfulness, because that pretty much covers our experience, right? Our direct experience. And that is where we, you know, experience dukkha. And so by becoming aware of 
you know, where it can arise in those aspects, we let go of dukkha, right? So, yeah, there is a variety of ways, you know, I think to sort of do it. In my experience, it's kind of coming back to understanding directly the mechanics of how this work, and then like whatever kind of methods might be kind of like helpful. You know, you might work with like just a single mantra, you know, or something too, or just free form kind of gladdening thoughts. Sometimes I'll work with as well. If we're talking about like the thought thing, like just like, you know, Oh, you know, this is such a lovely in breath. Oh, it's so nice. You know, just relaxing with friends and chilling out, you know, stuff like that, <laughs> you know, whatever's here and just relaxing and becoming aware of the body. Really one of the two rules of thumbs that um, I've come up with in terms of like what there is, is, Becoming aware, you know, waking up again and again, developing that sati with the body and the breath, and then also directing the mind towards the wholesome. And that's pretty much, you know, it. And, uh, you know, if that's kind of correctly understood, that's practicing, you know, the different steps of anapanasati. Um, but again, if you feel like going through it in that, you know, sort of way and investigating that, you know, have at it. <laughs> So yeah, I think that was uh, <laughs> beneficial. <laughs> I think so. Uh, you talk a little bit about self-talk, wholesome. Uh, how do you use that and kind of what kind of use do you use? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. when? When, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, for the most part, like the practice of that wholesome self-talk, right? is going to be most of the stuff throughout the day and also you know when i'm not so much in a state where i'm like sitting in seclusion right so this can be during walking meditation and also starting to get you know into like you know seclusion as well and so wholesome self-talk is like nurturing thoughts thoughts that are that point directly towards um you know satisfaction like here and now so one of the phrases that I'll use is like this. It's just, this is enough on the in-breath. Letting it all go on the out-breath. Or like, this is satisfying enough. Letting it all go. So that might be a little bit more in towards like a mantra and working with that and having it come together with the breath. But that's actually interesting because it's practicing several parts of Anapanasati together, including like with the in-breath, you know, you can either, you can add sometimes, I mean, because I come from before this practicing noting. So sometimes I'll still continue with that, like, you know, inhaling. This is satisfying enough. Exhaling letting it all go so if that kind of helps you know to develop that sati and become aware you know that could be helpful too or you can drop that and just directly become aware of that right and just sort of come back to a thought that is going to be downright wholesome what is unwholesome are thoughts like you know oh boy i suck at meditation this is awful i need to go you know <laughs> I need to go spend $700 for this course or something in order to do this or what have you, right? Like thoughts that are of craving, thoughts that, you know, so it's thoughts that are, you know, in a way of renunciation. Another wholesome thought uh, kind of um, formula you could say that I like to use is I don't need and I can. So, for example... <laughs> I don't need to be satisfied because if I need to be satisfied, I'm not satisfied right now. You know, it's kind of going to that attachment and that craving, but I can be satisfied right now. You know, <laughs> I can relax right now. Right. So it's sort of this, um, you know, in a way it's working with that confidence and it's also working with that way of allowing it. Right. So allowing the satisfaction, allowing the joy to come um, and just being like, Hey, yeah, I can I can feel all right right now, but also hey I don't need that. So this is kind of like an immediate renunciation. This can be helpful too. Like if there's any particular concept or idea or what have you that I kind of covered in this, 
and like say you noticed oh my gosh this is leading to like dissatisfaction i need to understand that more right and it's causing tanha to come up it's causing this craving that's causing dissatisfaction here and now and be like oh i don't need to know that right now i don't need that. <laughs> whatever it is this is also working in step 16 of just relinquishing and letting go right so it's, it's being able to just drop that as it comes up whatever it is don't need it don't need it don't need it you know <laughs> it's resting and just coming back and being you know this is why i work with the phrase so much of like you know breathing in long this is satisfying enough breathing out long letting it all go just merely becoming aware of the breath is satisfying enough see when it comes to satisfaction it's about setting the bar so low that you can hit it every single time this works with <laughs> renunciation because and also through like the whole letting go of mystical experiences because it one of those things is like would you rather have all those mystical experiences and be dissatisfied or would you rather just be satisfied because honestly if you're truly satisfied you don't care about any of that and this is like the profundity of the teachings of the Buddha and it's so simple and it's so like easy and clear, but like, that's one of those things of working it in, right. Of just like, yeah, just come back and be like, yeah, this is, this is good enough. You know, cause it, it helps to dispel the craving. It helps to dispel the, um, the thirsting. Right. And it helps to keep coming back to being quenched. But yeah, I went on a little enthusiastically there, but yeah, no, I'm just so happy to be able to like share this because like this stuff, like, I mean, it's powerful and it's very, um, <laughs> it just leads to, to success, so much like joy and satisfaction and ease, but primarily what it leads to is the end of dissatisfaction, which is pretty much the most, um, secure thing you can have because it's fun i well i say fun but it's very succinct to understand you know working with satisfaction as the absence of dissatisfaction and not trying to solidify it as any particular phenomena which arises and ceases and so this is when you really step in and understand those last four steps of that letting go and the understanding with that becoming more aware of how things are changing, you know, the ability to have them fade away and decay and die. And as I, I talked about dukkha dying. Yeah, if there's any more questions, uh, did that help to answer your question too, Patrick? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, excellent. <laughs> oh. that, that was not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no worries. Yeah, thank you so much, Patrick and Keba, for showing up. So glad to see new faces coming in and yeah, being able to share the Dhamma. And it's funny, I had a different lineup of suttas. I had a whole thing lined up in terms of like, okay, we got suttas on generosity for the holiday season. And we had covered the Anapanasati Sutta like several times. <laughs> but you know what? I'm like, hey, we can just drop it all. And honestly, last time I covered the Anapanasati, the internet went out and I wasn't able to finish it. So I'm glad to get in there. And also with a little bit more, perhaps knowledge, a little bit more, you know, wisdom in terms of reading like the sutta, I was trying to wait until after I was finished reading a paragraph to kind of step in with commentary and kind of let the sutta speak for itself as well. So yeah, thank you again so much. Again, I can stick around a little bit longer. If folks have any more questions or, you know, if it's a good time to wrap it up, just let me know. I don't have um, any more questions. Thank you, though. It's been a good session. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And oh, one more thing before I leave, I'd like to add is also check out the Open Sangha Foundation. You know, um, 
for anyone here and also for like any listeners out there really wonderful stuff they're working on the website it's really coming together as like a whole social you know networking thing and also furthermore i actually do um talks on uh saturday so 7 p.m eastern standard time on discord so we also have the dama friends discord so that's got like over 300 people on there it's a great place if anybody just wants to come in and have like a conversation it's really good for that too and so i do weekly saturday talks they're a little bit more open they're not recorded and um yeah it's it's just so people can kind of share more free form with that so anyway, I just wanted to get that in on, <laughs> on the recording. Thought it might be helpful. What time was that? Yeah, so it's 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, I it might be. I'm usually, I either sleep or working. So I know yeah. I get a message and I'm like, shit, I'm working. I come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like one of those things with the time zone. I was just like, yeah. hey, that's a time I can consistently hit. So that was one that yeah. I, I went yeah, yeah, for. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Uh, I'll, if I cannot sleep, I will uh, <laughs> keep it in mind. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think I'm going to wrap it up now. And yeah, thank you guys so much for coming on. And yeah, really glad, you know, how everything went today. And yeah, just wonderful. All right. Goodbye for now. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>